The idea that consciousness is an epiphenomenon or an illusion or both is an unfortunate consequence of really weak theories of consciousness. Stuart, why don't you start us off? What is consciousness and what is the theory of, or what are the theories of consciousness that you acknowledge? Well, it's hard to define uh, consciousness. Um, people say experience, qualia, uh, phenom phenomenal experience, uh, feelings, uh, thinking, et cetera, et cetera. You all know what those are, uh, but, but it's hard to pin down. I define it as what goes away with anesthesia and comes back when the patient wakes up which is a good operational uh, definition and gives us a way to, to test for it. Uh, as far as theories of consciousness, most theories are based on the idea that the brain is a complex computer of simple neurons, considering only the membranes and the synapses in one frequency range, uh, being algorithmic and computable. Therefore, uh, put enough together with the, with the firings as bits and you have a decent computer. And uh, then they say, if you have complex enough computation, then consciousness emerges at some higher order level. But for emergence at a higher level, you need something fundamental. And we now know that inside neurons are these structures called microtubules that have coherent oscillations not only in hertz, uh, but in kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, terahertz, and even faster into the quantum realm. And these can override membrane effects. So consciousness is coming from this deeper level. So this objective reduction, the collapse of the wave function due to quantum gravity is a fundamental effect that would have been present in the early uh, universe. Well, I ask why on earth do we want a theory of consciousness in the first place? You see, consciousness, despite the ness that gives you the impression it's a thing, is not an object at all. It's a process. It is the process of being aware of, conscious of, whatever is in our surroundings. And I think, therefore, that to varying degrees, because as physiologists we can investigate the sensory faculties that any organism has, to varying degrees, all organisms are conscious in the sense that they have life processes and are agents of that life. And that agency necessarily requires that we should be conscious of what is happening. Then we can intentionally influence what is happening. That is exactly what Charles Darwin was describing in his 1871 book. And in turn, that means that life is necessarily purposive. So we already know what it is to be conscious of what is happening, and we know what it means to be an agent of life. What additional theory do we need? Isn't that a demand for a ghost in the machine? First, let me say that uh, the idea that consciousness is an epiphenomenon or an illusion or both is an unfortunate consequence of really weak theories of consciousness, uh, uh, that it's a, a complex computation of cartoon neurons. Uh, I, th I think consciousness is, is much more uh, uh, sophisticated and, and uh, has been, in the, in, in, been around a long time before in the, in the early universe. And uh, I, I actually wrote a paper that consciousness arose during the Cambrian evolutionary explosion because the organi organisms that we find there, or the fossils that we find, are very similar to some organisms that we have today, like actinospherium and Suctorian. And uh, if you look at them, they have a lot of microtubules. And I think what happened then was that there was an explosion of these organisms that had a lot of microtubules. They got more conscious and all, ten, all the animal phyla developed in, in uh, a brief 10 million years. So that was an acceleration. And I used to think that was the origin. But how did we get from uh, the primordial soup to uh, uh, Cambrian evolutionary explosion a couple hundred million years at least. And I, so I've changed the view and I think now that consciousness was there from the get-go and actually sparked the origin of life. Degrees of consciousness exist. And I don't think we should think that what it is like to be a bacterium, what it is like to be one of the early Cambrian animals, what it is like to be a bat, to quote Ernest Nagel, and what it is like to be us are in some sense very similar. They probably are not. There can be qualitative differences that depend on the degrees to which 
that kind of feeling is exhibited. So I don't go along with the idea that there's just one kind of consciousness. I think you were right to ask us that question. I disagree. Uh, all animals, plants, including fish, uh, have microtubules. All animals, plants, including fish, can be anesthetized. And they work, uh, the anesthesia has the same, almost the same effects on all of them. And we know that the anesthetics work on a common mechanism uh, due to something called the Meyer-Overton correlation that shows potency in putting humans, animals, insects, fish under anesthesia is the same for every animal. It's at, at equilibrium. So deep inside proteins, we have all these aromatic rings uh, where the anesthetic, where anesthetics go, where anesthetics bind, and specifically uh, block consciousness. Uh, uh, there's no water. It's it's hyd it's nonpolar hydrophobic. So it, it, the water is kicked out, and and it's oscillating. So it's it's warm but not noisy. So within these uh, nonpolar aromatic, what we call the quantum underground, uh, within within biology, our regions kind of thread-like regions inside all the proteins, particularly microtubules, which are very, very long, you can have uh, sustained quantum effects that are sustained at least until they collapse and give you a moment of consciousness. But that depends entirely on the basis of your position that the quantum effects are essential. I'm not sure of that, you see. I think that is something we've not yet... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.